here, somewhere in the garden. Uh, we have a, a collaboration just, uh, a few years ago that uh, works pretty well. And uh, it is uh, always a pleasure uh, to listen to the chemistry he's doing, because it's really a very nice uh, chemistry. He's going to speak today about uh, uh, energetic carbon with uh, zinc and aluminium that are used to uh, functionalize CO2 uh, through reduction. So this is a, a topic that is, as everybody knows, a hot topic in organic polychemistry. I would say that this is one of the few hot topics that still remains in organic polychemistry. And uh, uh, so I think that this is going to be a nice uh, talk. Just for those that don't know Samuel, he's coming from the University of Strasbourg, where he's uh, the director of uh, research at the CNS. And, uh, um, well, he, 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 gradu he graduated in Rennes. He made his PhD with uh, one of the great, not <coughs> raising, but one of the big stars of organophilic chemistry, that is Richard uh, Schrock. And Jordan, Jordan, the PhD. <coughs> Jordan, the PhD. And Jordan, the postdoc. He made a postdoc with uh, uh, Schrock. So, uh, and you now is uh, leading his uh, own research in Strasbourg using uh, oxophilic metals and uh, uh, to perform uh, organophilic fundamental chemistry and pathology. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna, for the introductions and thank you all for being here. It's always a pleasure. I think I was thinking when Anna was. Introducing. It's always a pleasure to be in Lisbon. I think since 2008, when I first came in Lisbon, I tried to come at least once a year. So I'm, and I enjoy the city, and I, of course, enjoy the collaboration either with Anna and also with, with Teresa. So what I'm going to talk about today is our latest result, really, in the area of carbene chemistry, NHC, combined with uh, oxophilic metals such as zinc-2 and aluminum, and try to show you that with very cheap and biocompatible sources such as zinc-2, we can do actually catalysis and interesting catalysis in terms of, in particular, CO2 functionalization. So just before going to science, just this is a couple of pictures of Strasbourg. Some of you have been in Strasbourg, and some of you have been living for a few months, include, if not years, in Strasbourg. But this is, these are typical, uh, this is the typical architecture in Strasbourg with the jewel of the city, as we call it, which is a cathedral. And last year, we celebrated the 1,000th anniversary of the, the construction of the cathedral. So this is typical architecture, more like a Germanic type architecture because Strasbourg, as you know, is located at this part of France, very close to the German border. It's actually a few miles or a few kilometers, if you prefer, five kilometers. So back to, uh, back to science. I will give you a very short introduction on NHC. Some of you are, may include, maybe most of you already know what NHC chemistry and what's the interest of this type of ligand. So it really started in heterocyclic carbon as this, or this type of species in which you've got a central carbon here. And it really came out in the early 90s when Ardwenko showed that you, can, you could readily deprotonate it, this type of imidazium salt at the C2 carbon with a base to generate this type of species. Well, now, what's, re what's remarkable about this type of species is that they can be used, and they've been used over the past 10, 15 years and still now, as very strong donating sigma ligand for various transition metals, either heteroatom or even main group, chemistry, main, main group metals. Now, because of their strong sigma donation and their low pi accepting properties, they, um, the resulting metal complex, I would say, exhibit an exceptional stability. So the main advantage of carbon chemistry, and this is why they've been studied over the past 20 years as ligands, is the exceptional stability of the resulting complexes. The stability is of interest, of course, whether for fundamental reactivity or for using catalysis, because if you can design more stable catalysts, yet that should be reactive but stable, then you can improve activity, and in some cases, I will show you selectivity. Just These are early examples. This is old, but I, I always have to... Uh, I, I always like to... Uh, 
acknowledge the, the, initial use, the initial use of carbon in coordination chemistry and organometallic chemistry was by Grubbs and Nolan in the late 90s where they showed that the second generation Grubbs catalyst in which the carbon here replaced one of the phosphine is much more active. Actually, I'm going to give you an example. It's a, an old example, but a striking illustration of what NHC can do. This is a ring-closing metathesis-type reaction, and two catalysts were tested. Catalyst A is the first generation Grubbs. You can see you've got the two phosphine trans to one another. Now A is inactive under the studied condition. You don't get any ring closing. If you replace the phosphine with the NHC, you go from zero to quantitative yield under, simil under identical condition. And there have, been, there, are, there have been many studies on this reaction. It's usually believed that catalyst B is more active because it's more stable, or the catalytically active species is much more stable. So the stability imparted by NHC is certainly, this is a striking example of what can be used or what, uh, what can be the interest in catalysis. This, this was really the first reaction. Suzuki coupling was also a thing developed by Nolan, Nishin, and Glorious in, in the early 2000s that showed that NHC could provide actually exceptional turnover activity in terms of Suzuki coupling if you use this type of, of catalyst. Now, over the past 10 years, I would say there, there has been numerous studies, and those of you who work in organometallic chemistry, you well know that NHC uh, are quite used in terms of co for coordination chemistry and for studies of the derived complexes in catalysis. Now, so far, at least when we started that, this project five, six years ago, when you look at NHC, because it's a carbon coordinated, of course, the carbon is a carbon coordinated to the metal center, they've been mainly studied so far with carbophilic metal. If you look at the number of publications, they mainly involve palladium, ruthenium, platinum, for the basic reason that it was thought for a long time that oxophilic, uh, electropositive, and high oxidation state metal would not, the interaction with NHC would not be strong enough so that the complex would be stable. So in other words, it was thought, and wrongly at the time, um, that at the time being five to ten years ago, that the interaction of NHC with high oxidation state metal would not be strong enough to to get a stable complex. However, I'd like to point out this now old example that showed actually that NHC could even stabilize high oxidation state species. This is the example of vanadium-5 species. And those of you who work with vanadium, if you, you know that this compound trichloroxovanadium is quite air sensitive. Even in a good dry box or a well-ventilated dry box, it smokes a little bit. Now, if you add a carbine to it, you go from highly air sensitive to an air stable species. Okay. So you could say, well, that's because you've got an extra ligand. Well, it's not the case. If you replace the NHC with THF, your vanadium complex is still very air sensitive. So this implies that including with oxophilic metal, you could gain some stability using NHC. This is really when we, well, this, this paper really triggered our, our research because we thought, well, we can really investigate this type of oxophilic metal. So over the years, we've studied group four metal, titanium, zirconium, and hafnium, we do a lot of catalysis in polymerization. I'm not going to talk about polymerization today, but with group 4, we did some vanadium a little bit also. Group 13, of, of which I'm going to talk about as, uh, uh, at least the, the aluminum case. And more recently, we got interested into zinc and magnesium chemistry for stabilization of some species with NHC. So, if you look at the interaction, if you look at uh, a perspective of... Uh, of a coordination chemist, so you've got an NHC carbon here, okay, and you've got your metal center. So you want two things. You have two things that are remarkable, I would say, if you wish to coordinate your NHC to an oxophilic metal. First of all, as I said, we expect, in some case, well, we expect that the sigma donation of NHC will still provide an un instability to the complex. So this is classical. This is also what's used in carbophilic with carbophilic metal. And the idea, of course, here is to get robust organometallic catalysts and possibly the stabilization, stabilization of reactive entity. So this is the classical, I would say, approach of NHC that has been used for 10, 15 years. Now, in the case of electropositive metal, there's another thing that you can do is actually you can use the NHC to exploit, to develop novel reactivity. If you have a very electropositive metal, the, your carbon metal bond here, it's going to be quite polar, and this is a source itself of reactivity. Though, therefore, the metal carbon bond, because of its high polarity, 
is the source itself of fundamental reactivity and of small molecule activation. And what's going to dictate either you know, the balance of this on answer stability or on answer activity is really the nature of the R group. As I will show you the, in the second part of my talk, if you've got very bulky group here, then you enhance the, the polarity of the metal carbon the, the, the metal carbon bond, and therefore you can do some activation chemistry with small molecules. So electropositive metal, you can play both ways, stabilization and possibly on answer reactivity. So I'm going to first talk about the more classical approach, use NHC for improved stability. So if you try to keep things simple, what are organ the organometallic species that you wish to stabilize that are not so stable without NHC? And with which NHC could, add, could provide added value or added stability, I should say. Well, cationic organometallics of oxophilic metal are quite known. They've been known for a long time, 20, 25 years in a well-defined manner. They are known to be quite reactive. The only problem is that because of their limited stability, they're so electrophilic, they're so sensitive to, to water or to, to hydrolysis, that they've got, they, they've, they have so far limited use in catalysis. So we try to keep... Um, a simple way of thinking is said, why don't we try to develop a novel class of organocation based, of course, on cheap and biocompatible metal sources such as zinc and magnesium cation, and try to think about simple species. You know, this type of species, three coordinate cation in which you have two, TN, two NHC, this, this should be the most robust out of the three. This class of mono NHC, which may or may not exist, we don't know. Exactly, or we, we can even think about dication of this type in which the metal center is, chelated, is coordinated by two NHC. Now, of course, as you may expect, this cation include, will, in, will involve the use of non-reactive anions, such as this borane bath, which is quite common, which is, and the other one, which we have not used so far, but in principle we could use it, this type of carborane, which are kind of uh, exotic anion, less and less exotic because the synthesis of this type of carborane ion is getting more is getting easier, I would say. They are straightforward methods that have been developed. So one of the goals was trying to see, well, can, we, can we generate this type of species because they are, they are supposed to be, they could be expected to be quite attractive. And if we can, are they stable enough in catalysis? And specifically, two catalysis are of interest to us for mainly uh, industrial application or for application. First of all, it's an old reaction, alkane hydrocylylation reaction. This is an old reaction, but yet it's still of industrial interest. Why is that? Well, the current industrial process for alkane hydrocylylation uses platinum. Okay? There's no better catalyst as of today than platinum. So if we can find a cheap metal source, such as zinc and magnesium, to replace the platinum, that would be of value. And the second one, I'm not going to talk a lot about it, you've all heard about the, the problem we have with CO2 value, CO2, and of course, if we find pathways to, um, to um, transform CO2 into a useful molecule, such as through CO2 hydrocylation, that could be, you, that could be useful. There are, there are various organometallic catalysts that, have, that can do a CO2 hydrocylation. However, most of them use uh, late transition metal and expensive metal. CO2 hydrocylation is best performed to date with iridium, and ruthenium. Now, another, another thing that is interesting in this hydrocylation, you can see that you've got, depending on the level of hydrocylation, you can expect three products. Okay? The first one, mono reduction, mono hydrocylation. This is a formyl silyl, which is a direct pre precursor of formic acid, this is of interest. Now, if you do several reduction, three silane addition to CO2, then you go to the silyl ether, which is a direct precursor to methanol. Okay? So you can convert, if you can, uh, if you can access this molecule, you, get, you can convert really the CO2 to methanol. And then if you add a fourth silane, you can even go to methane. So currently there are no systems that actually can, selecti can selectively produce either one of them. So the idea was to try to see, well, first of all, can we do something that is active in hydrocylation? And the second step, can we develop product selective hydrocylation process? And what's most what the most challenging as of today, there are no metal catalysts that really uh, provide access to this silylator and to methane, while there are a few metal catalysts that do allow monohydrocylation. So we first focus on the easiest one, the zinc cation, which are supposed to be the most stable, and focusing, of course, on the most robust, because you, these three coordinate cationic species that are expected to be more, much more stable than the, the di-coordinate with a, one carbon. 
So how do you synthesize this species? Uh, it's actually quite easy. You start with the normal, or classic, I should say normal, classical carbon, which are well-known, substituent the mesethyl, 2,6-isopropylphenol, you can even use terbital, you coordinate dimethyl zinc. Then the key step is ionization chemistry with a tritol salt that incorporates this borate. So the tritol abstract a metide here, a metal minus, and you generate in the presence of THF this type of species that are reasonably stable, that can be isolated, but best if then if you add at this stage a second equivalent of the carbene, then you generate a very robust species. That is actually, you've got a three coordinate uh, zinc alkyl cation. It's actually the first example of a tris carbon zinc organocation. And what was, what is amazing, what is surprising, not that surprising, but what is interesting about it is that this species, so you've got an alkyl cationic zinc species that is air stable in the solid state, clearly showing you that the carbon has a, has a good stabilizing influence. This is the X-ray of this three-coordinate carbon. And the reason this compound, is, this cation is so stable is, well, of course, electronic stabilization by the two-carbon center, but you can see that the, the four mesethyl substituents are well intertwined one to, into another, and they really protect the zinc cationic center from decomposition reaction. Trigonal pr planar geometry of zinc 2, the zinc carbonate is a bit shorter than neutral analog that is expected. Now, this, is the this works well with the mesethyl substituent that is quite stable. Now, if you go, if you do it too much in terms of steric bulk, meaning that if you replace the mesethyl with a bulkier group, R group, meaning the deep, deep means 2,6-isopropylphenol, and you've got the X-ray structure. Now, you go from an air-stable compound to an unstable compound, even on the nitrogen. And probably you can see that from the, this is the X-ray structure. I think a better idea of the of the reason of the instability is, you know, this is steric, steric pressure is, is, um, is better viewed through the, the, the projection, al a projection along the, the, the zinc coordination plan. This is the mesethyl complexes, so you've got the classical zinc, you know, slightly distorted trigonal geometries with an angle between the two carbon of 126 with the mesethyl. So if the, then if you go from the R being mesethyl to R being 2,6-isopropylphenol, you increase steric bulk, and clearly, what you increase is that the steric, the, steric, um, the steric hindrance is too significant to provide stability to this cation. You, go, you increase the disangle from 10 degrees, and most impressive, whereas the, the <coughs> in these complexes, the zinc is more or less in the plane of the n heterocyclic. You can see here that the plane of the, N of the NHC is flattened because of steric interaction with the other ring. So the bonding of this NHC to the zinc is not optimal in terms of electronic property. This is probably what provides, what, what explains the limited stability. I should, the student was still able to characterize this cation that is actually quite stable, quite unstable. So it's limited in terms of stability, and what it does actually cleanly, this bis carbon here, bis NHT, what we call bis normal, you will understand why I call it bis normal, it converts and it isomerizes to a, a complexity that is quite unusual, in which you've got uh, NHC that is coordinated in a normal mode, okay, through the C2 here, but then the other one has switched from the C2 carbon to the C4 for steric release. But you can see in this complex here, you can clearly see that you've got steric protection, but the steric hindrance is much less significant. Now, <coughs> the steric relief that, um, <coughs> that is the source of this uh, of this reactivity can easily be seen by looking at the two extra structures of the starting material and then the resulting material, uh, the resulting complex. You can see that, as we saw here, the steric pressure is quite strong. And then now going to these complexes, you go from an NHC ring that are really compressed by one another to a planar array in which the two deep substituents are, are facing one another, but one of them is away from the zinc center. So you can see that clearly you've got a zirconium, um, a zinc cation that is cr uh, really stabilized bec because of the steric relief. So you can, or the, the observer activity is actually uh, explained by the steric relief, and this is the first time actually this type of a normal abnormal NHC rearrangement or isomerization is quite unusual. We've been studying the mechanism, we are not quite sure about the way the mechanism, uh, about the way this reaction proceeds, likely through the coordination of one of the NHC and then. Deproton internal deprotonation and then coordination at the C4 position to generate this type of species. However, this is the first time this reactivity was observed in NHC chemistry, zinc NHC chemistry. 
Now, now that we had this base carbon in, 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 in hand, I would say, we study initial reactivity with CO2 because, remember, we, what we want to do is CO2 hydrocylation. So does it react with CO2? Well, initial studies were not very promising because we, we started with this bis normal bis mesethyl and then bubble CO2 or put 1.5 pressure atmosphere of pressure in, in uh, bromobenzene. You need bromobenzene because this type of cation, they are, probably st they are, they are stable in dichloromethane, but they exhibit, I would say, limited stability. However, what we saw is that instead of having what we hope for is, of course, an insertion into the zinc, into the zinc carbon bond. What we ended up with a mixture of species with the isolation of this adduct resulting from the reaction of the carbene that is coordinated to the zinc with CO2. Now, if you go to the normal abnormal, so just the difference is just that one, one of the, uh, <coughs> one of the common is the abnormal, is, is, bond, is bonded in an abnormal mode. Now, if you do the same reaction, you get the desired reaction, pleasingly, I would say, and you form, you've got an insertion reaction of the CO2 into the zinc, carbon bond to form these robust complexes that could be actually isolated and it's relatively robust. So this, this augured well, this acetate complex, cationic species, suggested that some reactivity could be achieved with CO2 and we tested it in catalysis. Now if you look at in CO2 hydrocylation catalysis, very few things have been done with zinc and they're all restricted, I would say, with zinc hydride species things that have been developed quite recently, but the problem of zinc hydride are so sensitive that they cannot find any widespread uh, application. So zinc alkyl actually have not been used before we, we developed this work. So Parking developed this type of neutral zinc hydride and then showed that they could hydrocylate CO2 to go to the mon monohydrocylated species. More recently, Okuda showed that the zinc hydride cation, though they are not very stable, probably they, well, in the solid state, they form aggregate. I don't know what the solution is in structure, but they're so sensitive that in terms of application, they will be complicated to implement. But they do hydrocylate CO2 to yield, to, uh, to afford the corresponding monohydrocylation. I should also point out aluminum cation, this is the, these are the three examples, that do hydrocylate CO2 through a Lewis acid type activation. The problem of this system is, you can see, the anion is so exotic that and the synthesis is so compli not complicated, but it's so tedious in terms of its multi-step synthesis, that application and also selectivity is a problem in this system. So in our case, what we found is, is that this NHC, normal, what we call normal, abnormal NHC, were able to uh, hydrocylate CO2 in a moderate activity or acceptable activity. If you use five to six or six to seven percent of this type of uh, silane with CO2, 1.5 CO2, two and a half days at, in bromobenzene upon heating, you know, what you generate is this monohydrocylated species selectively. You don't see any over-reduction, meaning we don't form any methane or we don't form any silly ether. So this is a, a selective reaction. And since zinc alkyl are much more readily accessible than hydride, this is, these are, though the activity remains to be um, improved, these are interesting systems. This is actually the first zinc alkyl catalyst for use in, in CO2 hydrocylation. However, the activity was a little bit, you know, what the th is, the, is the thing to improve. So we thought, well, we, if you remember the initial scheme I showed you, we have, so we, want, we wanted to develop bis carbon, zinc, alkyl. So I said, how about going to monocarbon? I have to say, I didn't believe too much in the monocarbon. I thought that bis coordinated or two coordinated zinc cation would not be stable. And, and, oh, yeah, before that, let me show you the, the I forgot about this, yeah. Let me show you the mechanism of this zinc-2 catalyst because we've, do, we've done a lot of DFT calculation on this species. And what's known in the literature is very little. It's actually one paper because these are very recent results that studied the zinc hydride system that I showed you. So what's, the mechanism seems to be classical. Well, the accepted or the DFT estimated is kind of classical. You start from zinc hydride, Insertion of CO2, you generate this formate, and then you would have a sigma bond uh, metathesis through this transition state that would generate the monohydrocylation. So based on this mechanism, we thought, and based on the experimental result, we thought, well, we probably have the same type of mechanism with an insertion of CO2 into, into, our, zinc, uh, into our zinc alkyl bond. Then you generate this species. We can isolate it, as I just told you. And then the next step is probably a sigma bond metathesis, and we generate this initially the, with the metal here, and then once you generate the formate, then the, this is the active species, and then the catalytic species goes on and on. So probably we, have, we thought we would have a similar mechanism. Now it turns out it's not the case, and DFT studies were really useful in this regard. 
What DFT, I'm going to try to keep it short, but what DFT studies showed, and with this calculation have been going on for, I would say, at least one year, but they, they are finally over with. So if you start with this catalyst, okay? So this is our catalyst. You've got the normal carbon, the abnormal carbon, zinc metal. First step is a CO2 coordination and CO2 insertion. Now this is the very cost, this is the highest barrier of the, well, along with the other one, but it's a high barrier of the mechanism, you know, 25 kilocals. But anyway, you can actually, you have, you've got a, a coordination of CO2 to the zinc. This is the transition state for the insertion of, of the CO2 into the zinc carbon bond, and you generate this zinc cationic acid, which is a thermodynamic well, because you generate two zinc oxygen bonds. Now, the next step, what was surprising, either way we took it, or the, the theoretician, which is Christophe Gourlawen took it, he could not react directly to the silane to the species to generate an hydride species. There was no way. So the only mechanism we could came up with is the uh, involvement of a second equivalent of CO2 that actually breaks this acetate here to generate this species. So since you have to break the chelate and coordinate a second molecule of CO2, it's costly in energy, but the, bur the, uh, the energy is quite acceptable given the condition of reaction. And then the second step, once you have the, you've got this chelate broken, so the CO2 that is coordinated, then the silane comes in, and then you go through a transition state that actually involves two functions of the catalyst. So the catalyst is bifunctional, okay? So the CO2 that has comes in is activated by the zinc cationic center, okay? This, this activates the electrophilicity of the carbon here. But then the acetate here, okay, is nucleophilic enough to activate the, zinc, the, the silicon, and you go, to, you go through an hypervalent silicon that renders the hydride more reactive, and this hydride is transferred in somewhat of a cooperative manner from the silicon to another, to the CO2 that is, that is coordinated to the zinc center. And you end up with this form eight species, okay, that will be the active catalyst, and the hydrocellulation product. So this is really an unexpected mechanism. It's quite interesting because it shows that it's actually a cooperative, bifunctional catalyst. And we don't... So just to sum up, or to, uh, to put things in terms of the, me the mechanism. So what we start with is this type of cation, okay? First step is indeed, as we expected, the insertion of CO2 into the zinc carbon bond to generate this acetate. Now the second step involves, this is what we didn't think of, involves a second equivalent of CO2. And then this CO2 receives the hydride of this silicon, and the silicon goes to the other, to the, uh, to the other CO2. In other words, one simple way to, s to see it, the silicon or the, um, the silane, one part, the hydride of the silane going to goes to one CO2 molecule and the silicon goes to another one silicon molecule. So there's no zinc hydride species involved. And for months I've been asking students to try to isolate the species and, and they could not do it. So I thought, well, they, well they don't, maybe they don't know how to, to do it. But in fact, probably we don't form it based on this mechanism. We don't form any zinc hydride species. Instead, we've got a synergy between CO2 activation by the cationic zinc center, an assistant of the formate that acts as a nucleophile towards silane. So this kind of a bifunctional cooperative catalysis. So this is for the bis carbon system. Now, as I just said a few minutes ago, the problem of the our so-called problem or the limitation of this catalyst is certainly the, the, the activity. So we said, well, we've got two carbons on the zinc. How about going to one carbon? So we we are likely to generate two coordinate zinc cation. Are, they, are, are these species going to be stable or not? And I was not too hopeful about it. So we, the procedure of synthesis is the same. Oh, I forgot about... Okay, okay, okay. F forget about the first part of this slide, there's a, there's a mistake. Uh, so, okay, so the procedure that we follow is the same. You start from the carbon here, the zinc dimethyl, you form the same, the same, um, the same neutral adduct. Now, forget about this part, this is wrong. Okay, but instead of adding a carbon, what we try simply is ionization chemistry. Ionization meaning direct, re reactly, direct, reactly the trithal salt in bromobenzene. And so you've got a metal abstraction, and it actually does work. Amazingly enough, this you can generate this type of two coordinate zinc cationic species, which are actually, this is the first example of two coordinate zinc cation. It can be isolated and it is stable. And this is, a very, this is the extra structure, very simple compound, but very interesting compound. You've got the NHC here, the zinc, and the alkyl bond. So the zinc is sp-hybridized. You can see that the, 
the, the, lang the, the, uh, the bond angle is nearly 180 degrees, 175. You've got extremely short, I'm not going to go into detail, extremely short zinc alkyl or zinc NHC bond, which has, a, in, in particular, the zinc NHC 1.94, okay, is about one is, uh, is about 0 0.17 shorter than the zinc carbon bond, the neutral analog, which is enormous for a metal carbon bond. So clearly we've got a strong Lewis acidic center that is surprisingly stable, at least we were surprised. Now you can even go further in terms of Lewis acidity. If you start from this alkene, you react it with this borane region, then you can replace the metal group with a C6F5, okay? And which renders very simple, this quantitative, and which renders this, uh, the zinc cation even more Lewis acidic. It's so Lewis acidic that it even coordinates bromobenzene. And we could confirm the coordination through X ray crystallography. This is the, uh, the ad hoc formation of this cation. This is a very similar cation to this one, but instead of a metal group here, you've got a C6F5, though, so the zinc cation is much more Lewis acidic and coordinates the bromine. So, of course, these two are good candidates as strong Lewis acid for CO2, for substrate activation, and we started with, of course, CO2 hydrocylation. Now, what works, and it does work, actually, uh, luckily enough, so if you just do this reaction under the same condition that we did before, bromobenzene, 5% of the zinc cation, 90 degrees for 12 hours, you convert selectively over 95 conversion. Now, you don't go to the mono hydrocylated product, but you go directly to the silyl ether. So you've got three reduction selectively, and you form this silyl ether direct precursor to methanol. This is in the case of the metal group. Now, if you do the same catalysis, you change the metal to the C6F5. So in other words, you slightly increase the Lewis acidity. You do the same reactivity, and then you go selectively to methane. One more than 95 conversion and selectively to methane along with this side product. So, this is a very interesting system in terms of uh, the coordination of zinc to um, <coughs> of NH to zinc is quite versatile because through a tuning, a fine tuning of Lewis acidity, we can actually selectively access to the monohydrocylation, trace hydrocylation, and the uh, the tetrahydrocylation. This is what I mean by a Lewis acid type mechanism, because some of you are not familiar with this. How do we form these products? Silyliters and methane. Well, the first step, it's a combination. We, are, we haven't finished yet the DFT studies, but the combination of experimental data and DFT suggests that indeed we do, a, we do have a Lewis acid activation mechanism. With initial, in the initial complex that we form is certainly CO2 coordinates to the zinc cation, then the silane comes in. You do first reduction, Okay, but what's, what's interesting about this, the first, the monohydrocylated product is more reactive than CO2 itself. So once you form this, the hydrocylation is going to go faster for this substrate. So it gets further hydrocylated. This, this dicyliliter is known to be quite unstable, so it's not surprising that it de deoxygenates probably to this silyl ether. Now, at this stage, depending on the catalyst, it will either stay here and go back and do the catalyst and liberate this cililiter. Then if you've got a more Lewis acidic zinc center, it will proceed till methane, as I showed you. So probably this is a very simple type of mechanism. And DFT, as I said, they are not finished with it. But the first steps are well modeled, and clearly we have the zinc cation is Lewis acidic enough to do this type of, of very simple uh, Lewis acid reaction. So just to summarize, if you if I, to give an overview of the interaction of NHC with zinc cation, with this catalysis, we can really do, through coordination chemistry, tune the product, the nature of the product. If you start with the biscarbon, if you remember what I told you, biscarbon, normal abnormal, we selectively obtain this monohydrocylation, okay? If you remove one carbon, you have a more Lewis acidic zinc center than with an alkyl, then we go to the silyliter selectively. Then if you even increase the Lewis acidity going from metal to the 6,6F5, you go to methane selectively. So the three products of CO2 can be obtained through an interplay with coordination chemistry. So this is my part for the... Uh, the I'm going to stop here for the zinc. I'm going to quickly... How much time do, do I have left, Anna? Approximately? Just to Five minutes. Five minutes? Wow, okay. Yeah, so I'm going to go fast on this uh, aluminum part. This is what I thought. I'm, I'm not going to be able to talk about this much. So, okay, the, uh, if you remember what I said earlier, the use of NHC with electrophilic and uh, no, electropositive metal also uh, 
um, has the potential to improve or to enhance reactivity through activation of the polar carbon metal bond. How do you do it? It's very simple. You can just, if you have a hard group that is big enough in terms of sterics, you're going to destabilize the interaction between the carbon and your metal center, and therefore the polarity here, because you're going to have a lengthened bond. The, the polar bond is a source of reactivity. This is the same principle that has been applied in frustratedly with pairs when you know, that, that was developed initially, yeah, now nearly 10 years ago, but these are two nice reviews by Stefan and Herke that show that, you know, if you combine Lewis pairs that are sterically hindered from forming the classical Lewis adduct, you can activate small molecules. The classical example being the activation of H2 with this type of bulky phosphine and this type of borane. And to form this, so you've got an heterotic rupture of H2. So it has not been applied with metal complex, very simple precursors such as trimetal aluminum or also. So we thought, well, we could, maybe we could apply this way of thinking the, with carbines and tri trialkyl aluminum. This is actually what we did. I'm going to go very fast on the, so you can actually, you know, very simply, you need a bulky NHC, right? As I said, the R needs to be big. Terbutyl is very simple. The ligand is readily available. You can form the adduct. It's very severely congested as we expected, as we want. We had all, even had a hard time to isolate it. This is the, the extra structure of the aluminum trichloride isobut um, disturbitil carbon. It's probably the most air sensitive complexes we had the chance, so called, to work with. It was really difficult to, to get this type of speed. And you can understand why. Because of steric hindrance, first of all, you've got the very less with acidic Ls, Cl3. And because of steric hindrance, the aluminum is pushed away from the plane of the, of the n heterocycle. So the bonding of the carbon is not optimal. And clearly, you've got some uh, strain. You get some rearrangement chemistry that you can do. So this normal, because of steric hindrance, also do the same rearrangement that we observed that, that I just talked about a few minutes ago with the zinc chemistry, the same type of uh, approach. The steric relief is a driving force. Now, I'm not going to talk about the mechanism of this. We studied that over the years. Over the, the past few years, just show you uh, to, 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 yeah, I, I will go fast. The reactivity studies are, you can, we can do many things. I will, uh, yeah, I'm going to switch the calculation also. This is interesting. We, we were able to show by NMR by using a free carbon as a, as a, as a probe that actually this, this, um, this adduct does readily, does probably, I would say, readily dissociate on the NMR. Con on the, um, under the studied condition, which are room temperature. We got a delta G of activation of 15 kilocals, so which is consistent more or less with a slow dissociation we could of, this, of this type of this adduct under the uh, uh, at room temperature, which prompt us to study its reactivity of H2. And we are happy to see that it does activate H2. If you start with this simple adduct, bubble H2 for a, for a few hours, what you end up with is this strand species in which the carbene has been hydrogenated, so the H2 has been, the two H2 are now found on the carbene, so it's a so-called aminal type of species, and we believe that the time, well, well, how do we form that? What's likely to happen is that H2 breaks the metal carbon bond, so the carbene gets protonated by H2, and then the H- minus goes on the aluminum trimetal, and then you generate an aluminum hydride that is probably not stable. And then the hydride reacts back with the imidazolium, and you end up with these complexes. And this was confirmed by the fact that, well, if you do the reaction with two equivalent of, of trimetal aluminum, you may be able to trap this hydride and form a bridging hydride, and then you would generate. And this is what actually happened. It's slower, but it does work. It's, it takes a couple of days in dichlorometane. It's actually stable in dichlorometane. If you put this very simple adduct, one atmosphere of H2, dichlorometane, room temperature, what you end up with the, is the corresponding imidazolium salt here, and interestingly, an hydride trialkyl aluminum of this type that is stable and isolable. These are unfortunately ionic liquids, so we could not, at, at least to date, uh, till now, I would say, crystallize that, but you can clearly identify it and by NMR. So it's quite interesting because this is, a, if you look at the literature, if you want to convert trialkyl or trimetal aluminum, the reaction with, with H2 of this type of species typically require high temperature over 150 degrees and pressure over 20 bars. And just using the principle of FLP and the bulky carbon, we can do it at room temperature, though the time of the reaction 
need to be improved, but you can readily convert trial-kill aluminum to, to an anionic species, to the corresponding, I should say, aluminum hydride species. Oh, man, what happened? This had to... Sorry about this. The computer is getting... Okay. Yeah. I'm going to very quickly through the mechanism to show you that it's actually feasible. It, it's been rationalized through DFT. If you start from this other on H2, the key point, well, the key, the key step, or I should say the Iberia step, is, of course, the dissociation. And we could actually localize a pre-complex in which H2 is in between LMA3 and the carbon, a transition state in which the H2 is elongated. And then the rupture of H2 is actually exothermic, and it's favored thermodynamically. And you've got, you've got this aluminum hydride here. And of and of course, at this stage, if you don't have an extra trimetal aluminum, then the hydride goes back to the imidazium to form this species. But this mechanism was also established with the trimetal, uh, with the addition of two, uh, the second equivalent of trimetal species. Okay. Just to show you that if you go too far in terms of Lewis acidity of aluminum, if you go instead of trimetal to the trichloro or even the tri C6F5, then you don't get any H2. Why is that? Well, the adduct is too stable. Okay, you went too far in terms of Lewis acidity. So you need to find a fine balance between Lewis acidity and, Le and steric bulk. Last, just last thing I want to show in terms of unusual reactivity due to sterics is the fact that if you start from this adduct, you had an excess trimetal aluminum. What you observe is actually deprotonation of trimetal aluminum, and you end up with this type of unusual species in which you've got an anionic aluminum polynuclear aluminum with a CH2 to minus here that with a penta-coordinated carbon, carbon and the corresponding imidazolium that arises from the deprotonation from the carbon. I think it will be more clear if I show you the mechanism. Yeah, well, I'm not sure. Okay. What's the mechanism of distraction? Well, the mechanism, it, you, you start from this adduct and you add an excess of trimetal aluminum. Trimetal aluminum is a dimer in solution. It's Al2Ma6. So what happens is that the dimer reacts. This is the dimer of trimetal aluminum. And <coughs> Al2Ma6 is able to, to uh, dissociate this adduct. And the carbon that is partially dissociated actually deprotonates one of the CH3 of the bridge here through a transition state that is, you can see here, that is not high in energy. Overall, it's roughly a 9 kilocals um, barrier. And you form directly this type of methylene, you form the corresponding methylene, uh, methylene anion along with NHC. So this methylene anion, I'm not going to go through the calculation. The calculation were aimed at showing that this carbon here, this carbon here is actually a true penta-coordinate carbon because you've got orbital interaction with the five bonds. It's not only electrostatic. We've, we show that orbital interaction proceeds in the five directions. So we truly have a penta-coordinate carbon. But I'm not going to go into the detail. Just to finish with, I just show you that I can show you that this simple methylene carb, uh, anion, which is which can be easily done by anybody. You know, you just have a carbon, you add trimetal aluminum in excess, you generate the species quantitatively. Then you can use it actually as a methylene eight agent, very much like the Witting reagent. And we've shown with various ketone substrate that actually proceed quite fast and selectively, either with standard substrates such as benzophenone to generate the corresponding methylene species. It even works with bulky and analyzable ketone, which is not always the case. So it works quantitatively within a few minutes or a few, up to two hours. You may need to go to a lower temperature in case of analyzable ketone such as acetophenone, but it's quite a versatile substrate and simple alternative to the Vitig region. The only drawback, I should say, to be honest, is that unlike the Vitig region that is quite reactive with ester, esters, it's not as reactive. So it's good for ketone and aldehyde, but for less reactive substrates such as ester, at least based on the preliminary, preliminary studies, it's, are, it's much less reactive. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop here and summarize the conclusion. So I hope I somewhat convince you that the combination of NHC with very simple and cheap metal source and oxophilic metal source such as zinc and aluminum, and I talk more about zinc, can be the source of interesting chemistry and especially through, uh, through uh, an instability of the complex, the isolation of unusual species, including two coordinate 
and three coordinate NHC supported organocation that were shown actually to be robust enough for various for product selective CO2 hydrocylation catalysis. It is combining this NH with, uh, with uh, aluminum. I didn't talk about much about aluminum, but there are also nice reactivity, novel reactivity that could be observed. First of all, activation of H2, deprotonation of LMA3, and also some organic application of the TEP region. We've done a lot of calculation also. There are some fundamental aspects in terms of bonding that are interesting, uh, but uh, I have no time to talk about it, and I think we can talk maybe later about it. So let me, for those who are interested, let me acknowledge the, the people who did the work, because I didn't do the reaction. First of all, David Specklin, who's the one who contributed. Who Most of the zinc CO2 chemistry that I showed you, it's recent work, actually, was done by David, who was an excellent uh, postdoc. He did the very sensitive, and all the catalysis, actually, or most of the catalysis was done by David. And, Christophe started a little bit the, the, BCNA, the, the, the BCNH chemistry. Gilles also and Jean-Charles were also involved in the zinc chemistry. Georges and Beatrice um, in the aluminum. And of course, I think Teresa was a co-supervisor of Christophe and was involved into the, the CO2 activation initial works. All these people for X-ray and a lot of people were involved in calculation because I have a hard time to find theoreticians that are I would, I would say reactive enough because it takes years to this, to this calculation. For example, the mechanism on CO2 that I showed you is the result of two years of, uh, of work of Christophe who worked hard. He's from the Seine or Jean-Pierre also worked also a lot with the uh, aluminum NHC uh, uh, anion so that to better understand the funding. And of course, the money, the money mainly came from the CNRS and the university as well as the valorization center that we have for the CO2 activity. Now, for, appli applicative, um, uh, for application and that involves polymerization chemistry, that we, of which I'm neither going to talk about, but most recently they also finance or pay for the CO2 activation chemistry. Pure rack, I should not have put pure rack because these are for the polymerization, but they also more or less participated to, the, um, to the, the work of all these people. And of course, the FCT who paid for uh, Christophe for five years through a postdoc. And the, the role of Christophe in initiating the, the NHC zinc and CO2 activation is quite important. So the FCT should, of course, be acknowledged for this work. And I thank you for your kind attention. Well, that's because, you know, in the case of zinc, the approach was to the carbon, we wanted to, to get a more stable species. In the case of aluminum, we wanted the bulky carbon to destabilize. That's, that was the idea of the... Uh, the second part was really to use the carbon to have a, 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 a not very stable or less stable carbon metal bond. This is why we use the terbiter, because we wanted it to be unstable, because to be reactive. Yeah, yeah, I know what you were to say. You're right, Pedro, you're right. There is stacking. We didn't look too much. I think in solid state, despite stacking, obviously because of this. In solution, I'm not sure, because um, we do the NMR in bromobenzene, because it's not stable in any other solvent, so, or soluble. It's stable, but the problem of this cation is the solubility sometimes. So it's tough to say. In the solid state, there is spice stacking, for sure. What's that? The brown benzene is the only, you can, you can get other alternate. No, benzene also is okay. But it's not very soluble. In the catalysis, we do it in benzene now. It's not very soluble, but it's, if you use it as a catalyst, it's okay because the substrate and the solvent itself, plus it solubilizes the whole thing. But 
to do analysis of it. The benzene sometimes you form oil, you form oil. So, borobenzene is a bit. I, I didn't expect it to be called. It's not surprising, but zinc is not known to coordinate borobenzene. Mm -hmm. The Lewis acidity is so strong that it uh, stabilizes. Uh, 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 the final one um, about this mechanism. Yep. For the biscarbon, yeah. yeah. But did you try it right away at the end of the reaction, let's say, with the, you know, not in catalytic conditions, but in, in sort of 1 to 10 or 1 to 20? Did you try to isolate at the end of the, the No, what we isolated is the acetate. The metal species. We isolated the acetate. The first one. But after catalysis, we never... The problem is... Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. You mean do a catalysis with less substrate, try to isolate the... That's one to ten. And then at the end, you just work out the reaction. Yeah, we try to do it. For now, we haven't been successful to, uh, to isolate. Because the catalyst... You know, some of it also, under the conditions studied for the biscarbon, some of it decompose. <laughs> There's always partial hydrolysis. Okay? A little bit. Huh? So one, two, three... Per, I don't know. You, know. you can see it on LMR, so it's... It could be up to 5%. So if you put 10% catalyst, I'm not sure what's left at the end. I think part of the, the system is probably more active than it, but it's complicated under the studied condition. 90 degrees, you work at 80, 90 degrees with biscarbon that are actually constrained. They are not the best system. The, it, was, you know, it was the initial system that we studied, so uh, it will be tough, I think, to isolate the formate, honestly, unless we do stoichiometric reactions. We didn't try hydrogen because the problem, the problem of hydrogen, you're going to generate formic acid first, and it will kill your catalyst. It's a protic source, so, it's, so it will be tough to say if it works or not, because if the formic acid is formed, it degrades your catalyst, so you will not know exactly. The, si the silent source, it works also, I didn't talk about it, it works with borane, you can do hydroboration, of course, if you would work with silent. But you know, the, they react with H2, this uh, pre-catalyst, so I don't know what it probably goes with H2, but it's difficult to, to say if it works or not because the formic acid that is formed protonates the carbon of the, that is coordinated to zinc and it destroys everything because it's too, it's a protic source and it's quite acidic, obviously. But it, yeah, it reacts with H2 just to. Yeah. But in our case, we, we prefer silane because. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it does, they do react with yeah. H2. Yeah. But it's, it's going to be a, it's tough to say because even, even if it works, the product of the reaction, formic acid. Yes, it's going to kill the, the, yeah. Yeah, the system. To generate the hydride? Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you mean. There's no reaction with the uh, at least with the alkyl. We tried with the monocarbon zinc alkyl with H2 alone. It doesn't react the alkyl, so we cannot generate the hydride. But this is we don't actually. The, the one of the idea of this uh, because hydride there are no. The idea is really to keep with the alkyl because they are much more stable and mon and readily accessible. The hydride zinc it's exot it's crazy. It's so sensitive that. If we can use alkyl, this is perfect. This is even better. Yeah, we, could, we cannot. I mean, we, the only way from the alkyl to generate the hydride could be uh, we tried various things, H2 or silicon. The silane doesn't react with it. H2 doesn't react with the alkyl without CO2. So that's, you've got to have both to get the activation chemistry. But you're right. It could have, we could have uh, we tried to generate the hydride.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. In the, he, he knows this reaction, more or less. Yeah, thank you.